Welcome back, everybody. So lovely to be here today. I'm really excited to chair this symposium. Um, we're going to have four fantastic speakers from uh, the IDEA Consortium, which is Identifying Depression Early in Adolescence. It's a global interdisciplinary network, and our aim is to improve the identification of adolescents at risk for future depression. So we've got four speakers today, um, and we'll get started in a second. But just a quick reminder, please do use the chat function next to the live stream to make any comments and to interact with other people on the call. Um, and please, if you're using social media, don't forget to use the conference hashtag, which is hashtag IEPA 2021 virtual. i uh, love you to tweet about all the talks today. And um, if you'd like to ask a question, please do use the ask a question button under the live stream. So I think it's in green on your screen. Please do just keep adding questions as they come to you during the session. I'll be making notes and I'll come back to them at the end uh, for the live Q&A. Great, so let's get started. Um, so absolutely delighted to introduce our first speaker, um, who is Dr. Valeria Mondelli, who is a clinical reader in psychoneuroimmunology at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London, and an honorary consultant psychiatrist at King's College Hospital. So please welcome Valeria Mondelli. Good morning, everyone. And thank, I want to thank, first of all, the organizer for giving us the opportunity to present uh, some of the recent data from uh, the IDEA project. I am Valeria Mondelli. I'm a clinical reader in psychoneuroimmunology at King's College London, and I'm also a co-PI together with Christian Killing of the IDEA project. And the idea for us stands for identifying depression early in adolescence. So a little bit of uh, background around the project. So um, major depression is among the leading causes of health related disability uh, worldwide. And uh, among mental disorders is clearly the condition associated with the largest number of disability adjusted life years, as you can see here in the graph. The burden imposed by depression is really largely due to its early incidence and chronicity across the life cycle. By the end of adolescence, more than 10% of individuals have faced at least one depressive episode in their lifetime. So really the first decades of life represent a window of opportunity to reduce the burden associated with depression. So what can we do to, to reduce the onset of depression? Well, despite initial hopes, a large randomized control trials have really failed to demonstrate the efficacy of universal strategies for the prevention of depressive disorders. And it's been therefore suggested that the widespread implementation of uh, classroom-based prevention programs for adolescent depression should not really be uh, pursued without further evaluation. More promising results instead come from the target prevention, um, targeted prevention. Uh, so targeted intervention, for example, for specific groups of individual um, like cognitive behavioral intervention for children of parents with depression. So targeted intervention can be indicated, so indicated prevention, which is a, 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 you know, a target to individuals with minimal but detectable signs and symptoms of the disorder, or selective to individuals with high vulnerability due to the presence of risk factors. However, we have many challenges in particularly uh, char characterizing these groups because there is no consensus in the literature to how to define the risk for adolescent depression. And despite these difficulties, we believe uh, in the idea project that the development of a composite biopsychosocial bio risk score could improve uh, our ability to identify adolescents at these extremes, so adolescents at high and low risk of developing depression. What I want to also to highlight here is also the importance of a global approach. So as you can see here in the, in the graph on the right of the slide, the majority of randomized controlled clinical trials in adolescent depression have been conducted in high income countries with only a minority of uh, trials conducted in low middle income countries. But if you look at where the adolescents actually live, the majority of adolescents that live in low middle income countries, as you can see here in the, in the right part of the, of the graph, 
um, with uh, uh, much less kind of numbers in the high income countries. So therefore the IDEA consortium really aimed to look at this with a more global approach and including partners from both high and low middle income countries such as Brazil, Nigeria and Nepal. So the main objective of the IDEA project has been to identify biological, psychological and social markers that could help the early identification of adolescents at high and low risk of developing depression, and also that could be feasibly assessed across high and low and middle income countries. And you can see here a publication uh, about the IDEA projects that we published in Lancet uh, Child and Adolescent Health a couple of years ago now, which was really kind of explaining the concepts behind uh, the, the project. So this is really to give you a little bit of an overview of the IDEA projects. And uh, I will uh, focus on the second part of the talk a little bit on some of the results from the work package one, uh, while you will hear a little bit more about the other work packages uh, uh, findings in the next talks of the symposium. So as you can see, um, it, we have, uh, you know, if we start a little bit from the first work package, uh, the one here in blue, the work package one, uh, this was really to uh, kind of look at the state of the field uh, for early detection in adolescent depression. And uh, we did this by conducting a systematic review and meta-analysis of prospective studies, looking at risk factors for adolescent depression. And also we conducted as part of uh, this work, um, a Delphi expert consensus uh, uh, to look at really risk factors of adolescent depression. Um, and these have now been uh, published. Uh, you can find it online in open access if you uh, want to read more. Um, about uh, our results, but uh, very briefly, as you can see here uh, from the figure, the panelists of so the expert ranked 31 risk factors for adolescent depression on the basis of their feasibility of assessment and the specificity for depression. And the panelists ranked the three as highly specific and highly feasible to measure, including family history of depression, uh, exposure to bullying and a negative uh, family environment. But one of the main concepts behind the work of the IDEA project is not to focus only one risk factor uh, at the time, but really the need for combining multiple risk factors together. Um, and we learned this from other fields in medicine, that if only when we combine multiple factors together, that we can increase the accuracy for identifying individual at risk, and in our case, the adolescents at risk for depression. So going back to the overview of the IDEA project, then uh, what we really wanted to do was to develop a composite um, risk score, and we did this as part of the work package too. Uh, you will hear a little bit more about uh, that in the next talk, but basically uh, what we did was to um, uh, develop this uh, uh, composite risk score mainly on the basis of social demographic risk factors and uh, um, test it in the different longitudinal cords um, across the world, so in Brazil, UK, New Zealand, Nigeria, and Nepal. As part then of the work package three, we decided to recruit a completely new cohort of adolescents, which were stratified on the basis of the risk score, which we developed as part of Work Package 2. So in this new cohort for Work Package 3, we had a group of adolescents, which were deemed to be at low risk of depression, uh, according to the risk score, uh, a group of adolescents at high risk of developing depression, and one group of adolescents with uh, experiencing currently the major depressive disorder. And in these adolescents, we conducted a deep biological phenotype. And this was really to try to understand the biological underpinnings on increased uh, risk for adolescent depression. And finally, as part of the work of the DIA project, what we did was um, um, looking at the feasibility uh, for research and programs in low uh, resource settings. So as part of work package four, we looked, for example, the feasibility of uh, research on biological risk factors for adolescent depression in low middle income countries, as well as to conduct a qualitative study on the feasibility and acceptability of implementing a risk score for adolescent depression. And you will hear more about this 
in one of the following talks of the symposium. So let me move now to present some of the findings from our systematic review. And you can see here the reference to the protocol of the systematic review for work package one, which really included three main systematic review meta-analyses. And in today's presentation, I'm going to focus mainly on the third review, uh, which is uh, uh, now being published and which focused on really identifying the evidence for a relationship uh, between the biological and contextual risk factors uh, with the uh, um, uh, risk of uh, adolescent depression uh, in high and income and low and middle income countries. This is the work mainly conducted by Susanna Zayakoska, who is a postdoc in my lab. And uh, as you can see, also from the title, what we wanted to understand was the interaction between biological and um, environmental risk factors. And now this was relevant for detecting adolescent risk or depression. So a little more going more, more in detail um, for the review, we focus on a large number of environmental um, risk factors, focusing mainly on stress factors, as stress is one of the uh, main factors um, putting at risk for developing depression. But we kept um, a quite wide perspective. So we did not include only the usual uh, suspect of the childhood maltreatment, but also uh, exposure, for example, uh, to armed conflicts, uh, to natural disasters such as earthquakes, uh, such economic poverty, uh, family conflicts, and so on. And as part of the biological markers, we focus on a variety of biological markers previously seen associated with depression. And these um, included uh, neuroimaging markers um, like a structural and functional MRI, but also looking at inflammatory markers, hormones like cortisol, also looking at um, studies investigating transcriptomics, uh, telomere length, uh, immune cells, and so on. So here you can see uh, the PRISMA diagram of our systematic review. And you can see that from an initial identification of over 11,000 uh, studies, we were able to include uh, 21. And this was because the eligibility criteria needed for including the studies was that the study was both assessing, investigating both biological and environmental risk factors because we wanted to look really at the interaction between these two. So already this kind of tells us a lot about um, the fact that there is no um, quite uh, enough literature like in other, in other fields looking at the interaction between these risk factors. So we wanted to look at interaction and uh, mainly looking at two main pathways of interactions between environmental and biological risk factors, which have been previously suggested by the literature. So we focus on uh, diathesis stress frameworks that suggest that some biological vulnerabilities, for example, increased inflammation, may lead to the development of uh, depression within a stressful context. So um, for example, if you can see here, uh, the two cups, um, if we say D is the inflammation and S is the stress, it's only when D is actually higher, so increased, that stress uh, would make the cup full. So it's only when the inflammation would become higher, then the stress would kind of put you at higher risk of developing the disorder. However, there are other pathways as well that have been suggesting in the interaction between environmental and biological risk factors to take into account, such as, uh, for example, the mediational pathway, uh, which, uh, in which the exposure to a stressor leads to altered biological mechanism, which in turn um, kind of increase the risk for depression. So, for example, um, the exposure to stress will lead to increased inflammation and uh, the increased inflammation will then lead to uh, the development of adolescent depression. And here are some of the results in terms of the distribution of the studies. 
so what it was interesting to see is that the majority of the study looking at the interaction between biological and environmental risk factors were really conducted looking at other neuroimaging markers or cortisol. So you can see that um, eight studies looked at interaction between uh, uh, environmental stress factors and neuroimaging, and eight uh, looked at cortisol in relation in, in the interaction with uh, the environmental stress, uh, stress factors. And only three looked at EEG, uh, two studies looked at inflammation, and one at delivery length. What I want to also highlight, and as you can see on the right side of the slides, this second graph is that the majority of the studies were conducted in high income countries. So in 19, conducted in nine high income countries and only two conducted in low middle income countries. In terms of the results, it was also interesting to see that when looking at early versus recent life stress uh, events, it was mainly at the early life events to have more interaction with biological markers in increasing the risk of adolescent depression, while the recent events seem to have more an independent effect on increasing the risk of developing adolescent depression, not particularly interacting with the biological risk factors. And in terms of the biological markers, the ones that were more highly associated in terms of interaction with early life adversities uh, and increasing the risk of adolescent depression was mainly inflammatory markers and uh, functional and structural brain abnormalities, which seem to be more relevant uh, really for this interaction. So as you can see a little bit more in details of the results, and uh, some uh, biological markers in particular seem to be uh, more interacting with the childhood trauma, like a, a blunted reward related uh, activity uh, at a functional MRI, white matter destructions, smaller hippocampus, and higher levels of inflammation. And these seem really to interact with the childhood trauma in increasing the risk of adolescent depression. And from the literature, it seems that this is happening both through a mediation and um, a moderation pathway. So in conclusion, we can see how the combination of the environmental risk factors and neurobiological markers uh, appear really necessary to improve our ability to understand um, the pathophysiology of depression in adolescence and to improve our ability to detect individuals at high risk of developing depression in adolescence at an early stage. And the second point that I want to highlight is that, of course, as you can see also from the distribution of the studies, again, we need more research on this topic really conducted in low and middle income countries. So I want to conclude by uh, thanking uh, the people in the IDEA project. These are the list, of course, of the uh, fantastic uh, uh, co eyes of the IDEA project, uh, but uh, the list of the people involved in the project is much uh, bigger, as you can see. This is just also part of, of the team uh, when, uh, when we were on the face-to-face -face meeting in Brazil. I want to also thank Susanna in particular as I presented uh, her, um, her results from the systematic review and of course the funding agencies which supported the project in particular MQ uh, which helped really to, to start the project and also the other um, funding agencies like MRC, the Medical Research Foundation, uh, the Academy of Medical Science and the NHR to further support the studies. If you want to hear more also about uh, the project, uh, follow us on Twitter. Uh, we have uh, uh, an IDEA team uh, Twitter account. Uh, and also here is uh, uh, the Twitter, uh, Twitter account of my lab if you are more also interested in uh, immunopsychiatry uh, tweets. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to take questions at the end of uh, the symposium. Thank you ever so much, Valeria, for such a fantastic talk. Really appreciate the amazing overview of, of the IDEA Consortium. Um, so we'll move on now to our second speaker, which is actually myself. So I'm Professor Helen Fisher. I'm a Professor of Developmental Psychopathology um, at King's College London. Um, and we'll move on to me. See you on the other side. Don't forget to ask your questions um, using the green button. Hello, my name is Professor Helen Fisher. 
and in this talk I'll be presenting about predicting individualised risk of future depression onset among adolescents in Nepal and Nigeria using a model developed in Brazil. This work was conducted by Dr Rachel Braithwaite in collaboration with many members of the MQ IDEA consortium. Just to quickly outline my talk, I'll briefly provide an overview of the rationale for this work, followed by the study aims, methods and results, and finishing with a summary of the next steps. Major depressive disorder is a leading cause of health-related disease burden globally. It commonly emerges during adolescence and tends to follow a chronic course. By age 18, the lifetime prevalence of major depressive disorder is approximately 11%, and therefore it is important to ascertain early which adolescents are most at risk of developing depression in order to effectively target interventions to prevent its onset. However, prediction of major depressive disorder is still in its infancy, relying mainly on single predictors, the definition of at-risk people, with only a few studies combining risk factors. Therefore, in the IDEA consortium, we took the approach of seeing whether 11 risk factors that could easily be obtained from adolescents could be combined into a single score to predict which adolescents would develop depression several years later. These risk prediction models have been used for many decades in medicine, for instance, to predict risk of developing cardiovascular problems and are becoming increasingly used in psychiatry, particularly for predicting psychosis. They're particularly helpful because they can provide an individual's probability of developing future mental health problems rather than the average level of risk in a population, and thus can be used to identify individuals who may be most in need of preventive interventions. When creating these models, it is important to avoid overfitting them to the data they are being developed in. If they fit too well to the original data set, then it will be difficult to utilise them in other samples. Statistical techniques such as penalised regression can help minimise the likelihood of this overfitting occurring, so that the model fits the data closer to what can be seen in the left-hand graph and therefore the model is more likely to be able to be generalised to other samples. So here we use data on 2,192 adolescents from the Pilotis cohort in Brazil, who had no previous history of depressive symptoms. They were assessed for 11 easily obtainable sociodemographic predictors. You can see these listed on the right hand side of this slide. And these were assessed at age 15. They were then clinically interviewed regarding depression at age 18. Penalized logistic regression was used to combine the predictors to create an individualized risk score for depression for each adolescent. The area under the curve or C statistic obtained for this model was 0.78 which indicates that 78% of the time, the model was able to correctly predict which adolescents went on to develop depression at age 18. This is comparable with established prognostic models from other areas of medicine. We then tested how well it performed in data obtained on adolescents from New Zealand and also the UK, and found that the model performed better than chance in predicting future depression in these data sets. However, given that 90% of the world's adolescents live in low and middle income countries, and these countries face the greatest burden of depression, it is important to know whether our prediction model works well in these lower resource settings. Therefore, the aim of this study was to assess the ability of this model developed in Brazil to predict the future onset of depression in two existing adolescent cohorts from Nepal and Nigeria, which are lower middle income countries in completely different continents with large youth populations, high rates of depression and sparse psychiatric services. For Nepal, 
we use data from a longitudinal study conducted by Transcultural Psychosocial Organisation Nepal of child soldiers and civilians matched on age, sex, ethnicity and educational level. Those included in this analysis were aged 13 to 17 years old at baseline assessment in 2007 and 18 to 22 years old at the five year follow up in 2012. The sample thus comprised 55 child soldiers and 71 matched war affected civilians, 65.9% of whom were male. And all of them had no depression at baseline or at one year assessment. For Nigeria, we use longitudinal data from the Lagos School's Emotional and Behavioural Health Survey, which collected baseline data in 2016 and follow-up data in 2019 from 26 schools. For this analysis, from the 3,171 participants who completed both the baseline and follow-up assessments, we selected those who were aged 14 to 16 years at baseline which was 2,321 individuals, in order to be as close as possible to the age 15 baseline assessment conducted in the original Pilotus sample, while still retaining a reasonable sample size. We then excluded those participants who met criteria for depression at baselines, that was 393 of them, as this was an exclusion criteria in the Pilotus sample. Therefore, this resulted in a total of 1,928 students from Nigeria, approximately half of whom were male. There were only seven of the original 11 predictors available in each of these samples. Biological sex, child without treatment, school failure, getting into fights, social isolation and drug use were available in both samples. But ethnicity or caste was only available in the Pali sample, while runaway from home was only available in the Nigerian sample. In the Nepal sample, the Nepali version of the depression self-rating scale was used to assess depressive symptoms in the past week, with 19.8% meeting the cutoff for clinical depression at 18 plus years. In the Nigerian sample, the mini kid adapted for self completion was used to evaluate the presence of depressive symptoms in the previous two weeks, with 11.8% meeting criteria for DSM 4 major depressive disorder, 17 to 19 years of age. The linear predictor from the Pilotus penalized logistic regression model was recalculated using the seven available predictors in each of the samples. And then this model was applied to the relevant data set. This is called external validation. The model's intercept, that is the baseline risk, was then adjusted through recalibration, and this is called the adjusted model. Finally, the regression coefficients for the predictors were re-estimated in the relevant data set, and this is called the refitted model. The performance of the resulting models is evaluated in two main ways. Firstly, calibration, which refers to the level of agreement between the predicted probability of depression from the Pilotus model and the level of observed depression in the Nepali or Nigerian data set. Secondly, discrimination, which is how well the prediction model can differentiate adolescents with depression from those without depression in each of the data sets. This is measured using the area under the curve, AUC, also known as the C-statistic. An AUC of 0.5 indicates chance prediction, whereas an AUC greater than 0.7 indicates a good model with prediction greater than chance. And an AUC of one indicates perfect prediction. So here are the results. So starting with the Nepali sample, the adjusted Pilotus model was reasonably well calibrated, as can be seen from the dark line 
seem fairly close to the 45 degree ideal line in the graph. And the chi-squared test for the difference between these lines being non-significant. This adjusted model also showed reasonable capacity to discriminate between individuals who developed depression in late adolescence and those who did not, as the area under the curve was 0.73. Not surprisingly, when the model was refitted to the Nepali sample, the model performance increased. So next, looking at the Nigerian sample, as can be seen from this graph and the significant chi-square test, the Pilatus model was not well calibrated in the Nigerian sample, even after adjustment of the intercept, indicating poorer overall performance compared to the original Brazilian cohort. This adjusted model, however, though, was still fairly good at discriminating between adolescents who did and did not develop depression with an area under the curve of 0.62, although this is less than was found in the Nepali sample. And the discrimination only improved very slightly when the model was refitted to this specific data set. So to summarise then, the adolescent depression prediction model originally developed in Brazil and comprising seven matching easily obtainable sociodemographic predictors was able to predict which adolescents would and would not develop depression better than chance in both Nepali and Nigerian samples that we used here. However, the overall performance and calibration of the model was better in the Nepali sample. Nonetheless, this adds support to the transcultural applicability of the model to be used as a tool for early identification of depression risk among adolescents. Clearly though, before this model could be used in practice, further testing of the model's performance in larger socioculturally diverse samples in other geographical regions of the world is needed, along with inclusion of context-specific factors to test the model's wider generalizability. It's also important to think about if this risk calculator was turned into a screening tool, what might be uh, some of the issues related to that for, for young people themselves, families, um, other stakeholders, um, in terms of how feasible that is, are there ethical um, or other acceptability issues, and that is something that my colleague Brandon Court will talk about later. Okay, so I'll finish there, um, and I want to say thank you so much um, for listening to this talk, um, and a huge thank you to Rachel Braithwaite, who, as I said at the beginning, conducted all of the work that I've presented today, um, and also to the whole of the IDEA consortium, many of whom are pictured here, um, for all their help and support with this work. Um, and also a huge thank you to our funders, um, particularly the MQ Mental Health Charity based in the UK, um, and also the Academy of Medical Sciences um, and the Medical Research Council. Um, also encourage you to follow us on Twitter um, or to tweet about this and the other talks in this symposium, um, and the Twitter handle is uh, shown on this slide. Thank you so much. Great, so hopefully you enjoyed that talk. Um, I won't thank myself because it would be a bit odd, um, but delighted to now introduce our third speaker, who's Dr. Christian Keeling. He's an Associate Professor of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the School of Medicine at, uh, I'm not going to be able to say this, the University of Federal de Rio Grande do Sol, um, which is over in Porto Alegre in Brazil. Um, and he also directs the Child and Adolescent Depression Programme, or PRODIA, um, at the Hospital de um, Clinical de Porto Alegre in Brazil as well. And Christian is going to be talking about how we take those risk scores that I just talked about in my presentation and actually use them to recruit adolescents into a stratified cohort. Um, and don't forget to add questions you've got as you're going, we're going along um, using the green button um, below the screen. Thank you so much.
Hello everybody, my name is Christian Keeling. I'm an associate professor of child and adolescent psychiatry based in Porto Alegre, South Brazil. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our IDEA RISCO study. IDEA RISCO stands for Identifying Depression Early in Adolescence Risk Stratified Cohort. I'm going to speak uh, about the rationale methods, and the baseline characteristics of the IDEA RISCO study. The IDEA RISCO study is part of the IDEA consortium, and here you can see our logo, in which we have a world where borders and countries are blurred, as we want no barriers but a united and global approach to fight depression in adolescents. This is a picture of the IDEA investigators when we first met back in March 2017. Uh, since then, we have been conducting research that involves participants from Brazil, Nepal, Nigeria, the United Kingdom, and also the United States. One of the core notions behind the IDEA study is the need for combining multiple risk factors together. We can learn from other medical specialties, for instance, here the Framingham risk score for cardiovascular event, that if we combine multiple factors together, we can increase our accuracy in terms of stratifying high risk and low risk for a particular event, in this case, a cardiovascular event in 10 years, uh, but we could do something similar for depression. And it makes sense to focus on adolescence because it is during this period that we have a high increase uh, in the cumulative prevalence of depression. So at the same time, this represents a huge burden of mental health in early in life, in early decades of life, but also a very nice opportunity for prevention uh, and to advance prevention, we believe that we need to identify those at high risk to focus uh, preventative strategies uh, for this group, but also those at low risk that can inform us uh, about protective factors. We previously developed a composite risk score, an algorithm based on 11 different variables, uh, biological sex, uh, skin color, loneliness, problems at school, uh, use of alcohol and other drugs, involvement in fights, running away from home, relationship with the mother, relationship with the father, relationship between mother and father, and also the experience of maltreatment in childhood. This graph here nicely shows that combining information from all those 11 variables increases our accuracy, as shown in the last line, uh, our accuracy to predict future episodes of depression. So this is based on data from the Pelotas 1993 cohort, uh, those variables were collected directly from the adolescent at age 15, and the outcome was at age 18. And this is what we did in this paper, in which we analyzed data not only from the Pelotas 93 cohort, but also from two other longitudinal studies one from the UK and one from New Zealand. And when we combine all the information from all three studies, uh, we got uh, an area under the curve of uh, 0.77, uh, so a, discrimin a reasonable discriminative uh, ability to parse individuals at high and at low risk for developing depression. We have now externally validated this finding in four additional cohorts, making it replicated in seven samples of five different continents. One of the things that we are currently working on is to understand the differential role of each factor in each specific context. 
of major interest to us is also the identification and the in-depth study of those individuals at extreme high and at extreme low probability of developing depression. In a world in which time travel would be available, it would certainly be informative to go back in time and study those individuals who were at extreme high and extreme low risk for depression to understand better the mechanisms that could be associated with a high or low risk for developing the disorder. Movie, Avatar, uh, and we thought that we could try to recruit individuals with a specific profile, individuals with a profile of extreme high risk or extreme low risk, and then uh, perform, uh, invite them to perform uh, neurobiological studies in further detail that were not available at the time in which the large populational cohorts uh, were recruiting. And this is the rationale behind the idea RISCO study. The protocol paper for the idea RISCO study has been published in Frontiers in Psychiatry in June 2021 for those who want to know more details about the study. So this is what we did. We used the IDEA risk score to recruit a new cohort, this time in Porto Alegre. This is a map of Porto Alegre. Uh, you can see uh, in uh, red in the map uh, all the schools that we visited. So 101 schools in the city of Porto Alegre covering different uh, geographical areas of the city. We uh, assessed 7,720 individuals, uh, adolescents, aged uh, 14 to 16, to identify uh, who among them were at high risk and who were at low risk for developing depression. One question that uh, one might ask in this sense is, is it possible to use a risk score developed in Pelotas originally to recruit adolescents in Porto Alegre. In these two graphs, you can see that indeed the IDEA risk score is higher in Porto Alegre in 2018. Uh, this is when we did the recruitment uh, here in Porto Alegre in comparison to uh, the original Pelota score that was collected in 2008, so 10 years before. You can see that both for females and males, uh, in purple, the Porto Alegre score is higher than the Pelota score. Although there is a similarity in terms of the shape of the distribution of the score for females and males. If we look particularly individually at a specific risk uh, uh, variables, you can see that almost all of them are more prevalent in Porto Alegre in comparison to Pelotas. Uh, the only one that is not, uh, uh, that there is no different is uh, uh, biological sex. And the only one that is more prevalent uh, in Pelotas than in Porto Alegre is school failure. Uh, but this is uh, this might be explained by the fact that the Pelotas data set is a uh, uh, population-based uh, cohort, and in Porto Alegre we did a school sampling, uh, which might decrease uh, the prevalence of school failure because uh, many uh, adolescents uh, who fail at school unfortunately draw also have a higher chance of dropping out of school. A more sophisticated analysis uh, to compare the risk score in Pelotas and Porto Alegre is a network approach. So in a network approach, we look for correlations between all the variables uh, simultaneously. And you can see here in the uh, first figure is the network association for Pelotas. In the second one is the network association for uh, Porto Alegre. And as you can see, there is a high similarity and there is no statistical difference between those two networks. You can see that the positive and negative associations are very similar. They differ a little bit in terms of the strength of the association, but are very similar in both settings. 
So uh, mainly because of this finding, we believe that it is reasonable to use the idea risk score to recruit a new sample in Porto Alegre. And as I mentioned, this is what we did. Here in these two graphs, you can see first for girls and then for boys. Uh, these are all the 7,720 dots, so are the 7,720 adolescents. And uh, in color, you can see uh, in green the low risk individuals who were recruited in the IDEA risk of study. So those individuals who are below the 20th percentile for the risk for the IDEA risk score, but also had low depressive symptoms at the time of the assessment. In uh, yellow, uh, uh, you can see uh, the high risk group, so those also without depressive symptoms, but at a very high risk for developing depression, so they are above the 19th percentile for developing depression. And in red, we have the depressed group, so uh, adolescents already with high level of depressive symptoms. We decided to uh, also have as an inclusion criteria for the depressed group that they also score high in terms of um, uh, risk for depression to allow two by two comparisons between the group. This is the final idea risk of sample in which we have one group of adolescents with no lifetime diagnosis of depression, lifetime or current diagnosis of depression, and low risk for developing depression, 50 adolescents with no lifetime or current uh, history of uh, depressive episode, and uh, an extremely high risk for developing depression in the next three years, and also a group of 50 adolescents with a current untreated depressive episode. Uh, in addition, to a very detailed clinical assessment, both with the adolescents and with the primary caregiver. We collected blood and saliva samples and also performed both structural and functional neuroimaging studies with this sample. From a clinical perspective, there is a clear difference between groups in several measures. You can see here in A, the mood and feelings questionnaire. So this is a self-report by the adolescents, compares the low risk, high risk, and depressed group. The CDRS is a clinician rated measure of depression. The SHAPS is a measure of anhedonia. Uh, the ARI is a measure of irritability. The SCAS of anxiety, the CTQ is experience of uh, maltreatment. Uh, uh, in uh, the YSI is a measure of uh, positive attributes. So there is a, here a, a, an opposite direction. The uh, uh, the, the, the graph in the middle is uh, about suicidality, so it's the Columbia scale. And interestingly, there were no differences in terms of IQ uh, among the three groups. From a parent-rated perspective, you can see also a difference in symptoms of depression. Uh, also, self-report symptoms of depression by the parent about uh, themselves. So. Uh, maternal or paternal uh, uh, symptoms of depression, uh, irritability rated by the parent, anxiety rated by the parent, uh, positive attributes, and there was uh, a difference in terms of socioeconomic status in the sense that the low risk had a better uh, uh, status in terms of income uh, and other uh, indicators in comparison to the high risk and depressed groups. Data collection for the baseline assessment was finalized in December 2019. So we have for this 150 adolescents, in addition to the clinical information, the biological samples of blood and saliva, and the structural and functional MRI, we also have actigraph information to study their chronobiology and sleep patterns. One year after the baseline assessment, we also did a very simple assessment with online questionnaires such as the PHQ and the MFQ with the adolescents and with their primary caregivers. 
two years after the baseline assessment, and this is still ongoing, about to finish uh, in November, December 2021, we are collecting, in addition to the questionnaires, the online questionnaires, more sophisticated digital phenotyping information. This includes, in terms of passive digital phenotyping, information on GPS, actigraph, and also samples of the environmental sound of that individual with a particular focus on speech patterns and social interactions. We also are collecting in a more active digital phenotyping approach information using a digital assistant, a chatbot. We co-developed this chatbot with another group of adolescents with a, a similar age and this chatbot collects information for a two-week uh, period on the mood of the adolescents in which they can rate using numbers, using scores in, in, in traditional questionnaires, but also using emojis. And we are also collecting audios in which they send us at least one minute of audio every other day, describing their daily activities, their environment, and, and other information like that. We are now conducting the third year assessment, the third year follow-up, so wave three. And this is very interesting because this matches the original interval for which the IDEA risk score was developed. The wave three assessment started uh, in the middle of 2021. We have about 90% retention up to now. And it includes, in addition to an in-person assessment with a child psychiatrist, also structural and functional MRI. We are also collecting blood samples once again. We are repeating all the way through digital phenotyping assessment and also including the actigraph similarly to what we did at the baseline. In addition to the careful clinical characterization of the ideal risk of sample, including a risk stratification strategy that encompasses 11 sociodemographic risk factors. It is important to say that conducting such study in a middle income country such as Brazil contributes to co closing a huge gap in the current literature. Here you can see a systematic review that we perform on neuroimaging studies on adolescent depression. And Although 9 out of 10 individuals under the age of 18 live in low and middle income countries, you can see that only 18% of the studies of the neuroimaging studies with adolescents with depression have been conducted in low and middle income countries. Our work would not have been possible without the support from funders from Brazil, from the UK and from the United States and is a result of a very cohesive teamwork. In addition to my friends and colleagues in this session, I would like to thank all the IDEA researchers uh, from different backgrounds, from different parts of the world, everybody working together to reduce the burden associated with depression early in adolescence. Thank you very much for your attention. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Christian, for another great presentation. Really exciting to see how the Idea Risco cohort is actually beginning and how we're following them up. Very exciting to see what comes out of that. So our final speaker for today is Professor Brandon Court, who holds the Charles and Sonia Ackman Professorship in Global Psychiatry at the George Washington University in the US, where he is Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, Global Health and Anthropology and Director of the Division of Global Mental Health. And he's going to actually be providing um, a talk which really looks at some of the qualitative aspects of the work we're doing um, and thinking about what youth and other stakeholders might actually think about using these kind of risk calculated in practice. So welcome to Brandon. In this next presentation from the Identifying Depression Early in Adolescence Consortium, we'll be discussing a multi-site qualitative study about the feasibility, acceptability, and utility 
of an adolescent depression risk calculator. As previously mentioned, the IDEA consortium includes psychiatrists, epidemiologists, neuroscientists, and anthropologists from Brazil, Nepal, Nigeria, the United Kingdom, and the United States. In this study, we build on anthropological specialists who were able to do qualitative research across each of the sites. The qualitative study involved four components. We examined developmental, social, and health changes in adolescents, as well as depression in adolescents, perceptions of causes or contributory factors. In particular, we also looked at the issue of risk detection and possible preventive measures through the use of a risk calculator. We wanted to assess the feasibility, acceptability, and utility of using such a tool as perceived by both adolescents and stakeholders that work with them. Risk assessment tools play an important role in other fields of health, such as diabetes risk, cancer risk, stroke risk, and a number of other conditions. However, there has been less use of risk prediction tools in the field of mental health. This is especially ethically challenging when working with adolescents. Therefore, we felt it was important to qualitatively evaluate a risk assessment tool that had been developed via predictive modeling using cohort data from Brazil and tested on similar cohorts in Nigeria, Nepal, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. This tool determines future risk of depression and is derived from research that classifies risk based on the presence of sociodemographic risk factors rather than symptoms. The qualitative study described here explores the feasibility, acceptability, perceived utility, and ethical implications of using such a tool worldwide. The qualitative study was conducted in the four countries of the IDEA Consortium, Brazil, Nepal, Nigeria, and the United Kingdom. This included key informant interviews, which were typically done one-on-one, -on -one, focus group discussions, and all analysis was done using a framework qualitative coding approach. In Brazil and Nepal, there were adolescents who participated, and in all countries, a group of adult stakeholders who were regularly engaged with adolescents also participated in interviews. This included health workers, ranging from mental health specialists, to primary care workers, social workers, school staff, parents, and policymakers, for a total of 241 qualitative participants in the study. In the United Kingdom, the implementation of a depression risk calculator was seen as largely acceptable and feasible by most of the stakeholders and working with adolescents. There was a strong emphasis on the utility of schools to implement this risk calculator. Mobile apps and social media were also discussed. However, it was recognized that training and support would also be success essential for successful implementation of the risk calculator. A school staff worker in the United Kingdom said, I always appreciated when I did get information about students' home lives and I knew what was going on. That made my life a lot easier. So in that sense, it'd be really useful to have something that, you know, was evidence-based and you didn't have to do your own kind of qualitative interpretation of the data. At the same time, there were also ethical concerns by some of the respondents that either telling an adolescent directly or speaking with their parent or a school staff member that they were at risk of developing depression in the future might end up being a self-fulfilling prophecy leading to development of the condition. In Nigeria, there were both confidentiality and safety concerns. Because the risk calculator has facts that happen to most of the adolescents and they probably don't tell anyone, but if it has confidentiality, if you tell them you are not going to tell anyone, the person is going to trust you and probably will answer everything with this truth. They won't lie anymore, won't deny anything because they will be trusting this. That's what a depressed adolescent said. A school staff member in Nigeria also said, In Brazil, there was a consensus that schools were the ideal place to administer the risk calculator, with social media and apps discussed also as potential delivery systems. Supervision by a responsible adult during screening was recommended. 
confidentiality and safety concerns were raised by stakeholders as well, with training recommended before screening. A depressed adolescent said, because the risk calculator has facts that happen to most of the adolescents, they probably don't tell anyone. But if it has confidentiality, if you tell them you're not gonna tell anyone, the person is going to trust you and probably will answer everything with truth. They won't lie anywhere, won't deny anything because they will be trusting this. A social worker raised safety concerns in Brazil. She said, I think that in the case of my students, if they use the risk calculator, it would generate a lot of, I don't know, restlessness. The question is that they already have a broken bond with their family. So in this case, I think it would be very triggering. They would have a lot to deal with. There would be a lot of questions because it's really related to how they are living their lives. In Nepal, schools were usually recommended as the place of delivery for the risk calculator. There was disclosure and safety issues discussed with facilitated administration versus self-administration. Confidentiality and purpose of data collected were raised as important ethical issues to be discussed. One of the de delivery considerations raised by a Nepali policymaker was, a facilitator administering the risk calculator is one option. The other option is that it could be like a self-rater. Currently, every child or adolescent, they have mobile phones. So they should be able to fill in the tool. Also, they could you could provide referral and educational information automatically if they are in high risk. I think that if that can happen, then it will be useful. Again, there were concerns expressed around confidentiality. It depends upon the individuals, I guess. Some people, they just want to keep the information to themselves. But there are some people who are actually sharing with other people too. So both free disclosure or withholding information are possibilities, said one Nepali adolescent. In Nigeria, perspectives indicated a split over self-administration by adolescents or facilitated administration by a responsible adult. There was a high endorsement of exploring an online version or an app, but accessibility issues were raised as well. Use of the risk calculator results were raised as an ethical concern, with mental health training recommended for any stakeholders using it. One of the acceptability issues raised by a social worker in Nigeria was, you might have an adolescent who cannot read it. You might have an adolescent who does not have access to a phone. So in such a situation, you tend to want someone who is counseling or someone who is doing the psychotherapy to administer it to him. It could be oral, you could read it to them verbally, it can also be handwritten. There were also concerns related to ethics. Another social worker said, it'll be better for the child not to know if she or he or she is at high risk or low risk. Let it be known to the person attending to the child only. But sometimes if they know, it might trigger up some things you understand. So that's why it's even better for someone for them, you know, not to know. To conclude, there were a number of recommendations about a potential risk calculator for adolescent depression. First was the need to ensure confidentiality for adolescents and to assure stigma mitigation procedures when undergoing the process. Schools were considered well positioned for using the risk calculator. Training of facilitators before administering the risk calculator was considered very important. Exploration of risk calculator delivery on social media and apps was raised with consideration for accessibility issues among low resource stakeholders. It was important also to provide resources for high risk groups, such as referral and psychoeducation, and also to ensure proper and comprehensive ethical guidelines surrounding risk calculator administration, data management, and use of results. One of the overarching issues was the concern that learning one is at risk could be misinterpreted as meaning that someone is guaranteed to develop depression in the future, which could entail then a so-called self-fulfilling prophecy. Therefore, education around this would be crucial both to adult stakeholders and adolescents. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation from the IDEA Qualitative Research Team. For additional information on the topic, please contact me. Special thanks to Shabab Waid and Anubhuti Kodel for preparation of these slides. Great. Thank you ever so much, Brandon. Really appreciate you providing that talk. And I think it's so helpful to get some qualitative 
perspectives um, on what's quite a heavy quantitative project. So it really helps us get these different perspectives. Um, and I'm delighted now to be joined by uh, Dr. Valeria Mondelli and Dr. Christian Keeling that you've heard from already. Um, and we'll now open the, the live q and um, I'll please do keep adding questions using the ask a question um, button uh, that you see on your screens. Um, I don't see any at the moment, so I will start um, by asking a few questions myself and we'll see um, if other ones come in. So really warm welcome to, to both of you. Um, I wondered, um, Christian, if you wouldn't mind starting us off um, a little bit um, by telling us a bit about how you see um, the risk calculator potentially being used um, in clinical practice, um, both to identify adolescents um, that might need treatment, but perhaps also to inform the content of those preventive interventions. I wonder if you might mind telling us a bit about your thoughts on that. Sure. Uh, thank you, Helen. Uh, thank you, Valeria and Brendan for, for the great presentations. It's, it's a huge uh, pleasure to be uh, here talking today and working with you over the past few years. Um, I think this is a very relevant and interesting question. Um, to be completely honest, I think we still have to uh, study this in more uh, detail, in more, I mean, we have uh, up to now, we have identified a set of questions, a set of uh, variables that when we merge them together in a single, in a single um, um, estimate for stratifying risk, predicts uh, the, the probability of, of someone of a, a teenager developing depression. And this uh, has been replicated in multiple settings across the globe. But we still have to understand better the next step in terms of translating this into clinical practice, either for prevention or for early intervention uh, uh, care or uh, treatments. So I think that the challenge we have here is to understand for which sorts of intervention and at what level of uh, uh, risk load uh, would uh, uh, each intervention would be more beneficial. So the analogy that I think it's helpful here is uh, in, in the field of cardiovascular medicine, uh, we don't recommend statins for everybody. It depends on the risk that that individual, the baseline risk that that individual has. Uh, there is a, a risk beneficial, um, uh, um, risk benefit ratio to, for, to, to understand before recommending a specific either preventative or even uh, a, a secondary um, preventive uh, strategy. So I think this is the next step for uh, us in terms of understanding how the risk stratification works in terms of responding to a particular uh, 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 intervention. We could imagine that there are some, some aspects, for instance, the experience of maltreatment with negative thoughts would, re would respond better to a CBT-based intervention. Maybe uh, if someone has a high load of interpersonal problems and re uh, issues in relationships, uh, an IPT-based intervention would be more helpful, but we still have to uh, test this uh, and empirically see if this is really the case. Great, thank you. I don't know, Valeria, if you want to add anything on that side, perhaps from a from a more biological perspective, about what you might do. Yes, no, I agree with Chris, and I think one of the things that probably I would have also added is uh, the possibility also to use exactly the information from you know the the risk score to to understand uh, what kind of. Uh, uh, treatments uh, we we can in some way develop um, and it might be as Kristen was saying kind of slightly different uh, um, you know according to the risk load but also on I think I guess on the um, variables that are playing on the on the risk load and uh, and in that sense then uh, you know linking to what you were asking Helen in regards with the biological uh, factors. I think that would be important in particular if we are thinking about more um, kind of biological type of interventions, which could be uh, not even, uh, you know, the particular kind of medications, but also, um, I don't know, dietary supplements or something which can modify in, in a more <laughs> kind of gentle way uh, the biological systems or in physical exercise, for example, which might be more relevant for 
uh, a specific um, kind of uh, adolescence with the specific type of uh, risk factors and, and how these risk factors are kind of loading on the overall risk score, if it makes sense. Um, so I think we are we are on the right track. As Christian was saying, I think we might need a little bit more work to understand how to use it in the future. But I think this is probably the, the, the best way forward that, that, that we have, given you know, the wide uh, heterogeneity of, uh, of the condition um, and you know, uh, of depression in, uh, in adolescence as well. Yeah. That makes sense. I wonder if you wouldn't mind, Valeria, if you're happy to, would you want to share any of the kind of preliminary findings that you're finding in terms of of the biological markers for those who are high versus low risk? I don't know if you're happy to summarize. Yes, um, it's very exciting, I think, because we have done quite a lot of work over the past few years uh, as part of the IDEA uh, uh, project, in particular in uh, conducting a, a deep biological phenotype of the IDEA risk court, which is really trying in some way to understand what are the biological underpinnings of the the increased risk and uh, some of the papers have already been published with the neuroimaging findings which are really interesting because we see already some uh, differences between uh, the low risk and high risk uh, cohort um, the ones that we have not yet published and that we are working on the paper are on the inflammatory markers and we have also done a genome-wide gene expression with RNA sequencing. So in the inflammatory markers, uh, it's interesting what we start to see, and I don't want to give away too much at the moment, but it's a difference in uh, uh, between the biological sexes. So we see that how the um, kind of, uh, uh, for example, childhood trauma affects the inflammatory markers, uh, probably different uh, in uh, girls and in boys. And this is very interesting because it's something that is coming out more in the literature now. We need to be aware of also the differences of these environmental risk factors um, in, in girls and boys because they might have slightly different biological mechanisms and maybe need to be tackled also from a biological perspective in a slightly different way um, so stay tuned because we are <laughs> working on the on the data both for the inflammatory markers and for the gene expression and there are some very interesting findings coming up okay, thank you and i wondered christian i'm still waiting for questions they so do put, ask a question in the in the uh, in the box if you've got one while you're listening um, in the meantime i wondered christian if you could tell us a bit more about what you're doing on the technology side with the cohort, perhaps telling us a bit more about the chatbot um, that your team have developed and what that's what that's starting to, to find. Yes, sure. Uh, I mean, this is something that we uh, started developing before the pandemic, uh, but in the end that uh, uh, showed to be very helpful to keep the assessment during the, 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 the period of the pandemic. Um, we uh, we were fortunate to to receive uh, uh, you are you you are our PI at the Royal Academy of Engineering grant to support the development of digital phenotyping assessments for the IDEA RISCO uh, study, and um, uh, we thought that it would be interesting to uh, use a principle that you, we use in clinical practice that is to go where our patients are or where our participants are. And based on the, the, the survey that uh, we did in the 7,720 adolescents uh, at the schools here in Porto Alegre, we identified that 51% of them said that they were using WhatsApp all the time uh, and 86% uh, at least several times a day. So we thought that instead of developing a new app as uh, many initiatives have done up to now, an app that sometimes go into what I call the app cemetery in our phones that we install the app and never use uh, the app anymore. We wanted to use something that the adolescents are already using in their day-to-day -day, uh, uh, lives. So we co-developed, we selected a group of, uh, another group of adolescents to co-develop this app, uh, um, not, not an app, they this chatbot uh, with them. Uh, so it is a chatbot uh, that interacts with them for uh, uh, 15 days, so two weeks. Uh, every other day, it collects audio or text messages asking about their mood, about how they're doing. And it was very 
good that we uh, use the co-development approach for several reasons. Just to give an, one example, we were planning for the chatbot to start the interaction with the adolescent at, at 10 a.m. in the morning because we thought this was not very early. Uh, and I mean, it would, it would start the day for them. Uh, they would have some information about their day at, at, at that point. But it, there was, uh, they were, uh, the group, the focus group that we did was unanimous in saying that this was too early because either they are at school at 10, at 10 in the morning, uh, otherwise if this is a weekend, they are, they are uh, at sleep. So they suggested we should start at, at 1 uh, p.m. and go later in the night in terms of allowing them to respond later in the night. We also have like a, a snooze function in which they can uh, select, when we start the interaction, they can select a later time in the day to interact with the bot. So we try to do as personalized as possible. And uh, I don't have the final numbers yet, but I can say that the retention rate uh, is pretty high uh, for uh, the responses uh, uh, over this two week period that we are using. Uh, for the wave two that we are about to finalize and then for wave three which is uh, 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 about uh, halfway through uh, up to now so uh, we're excited about the the, the retention rate and uh, looking forward to to analyze the results very soon great and it's just a, an amazing team effort as well isn't it really so many people come together to, to make that happen but lovely to to think about how to use technology in a way that's useful, I think, for, for adolescents and to engage them in quite a different way. And I don't know, Valeria or Christian, if you want to say anything at all about how you're planning potentially to use technology um, in terms of, um, of treatment um, and, and monitoring of, of symptoms perhaps in the future. I don't know, Valeria, if you want to add anything on that at all? Or? Yes, I mean, this is <laughs> something that uh, is on the wish list in terms of uh, we are pending funding in a way. Um, but we, we would really like to kind of use in some way what we've learned from, uh, you know, the, the, the IRIS score uh, as well as kind of using the techno technology in adolescence to be able to provide some more kind of personalized feedback to the adolescents uh, and in, uh, in the real time. So it would be um, something that we are trying to kind of in some way to develop uh, um, to, to be able in some, as we were saying, to, to have more personalized intervention. I think we were hearing also from the previous speaker in the plenary session, how some intervention uh, you know, could be uh, good for some, uh, but not for all the adolescents. And also the timing, you know, it could be good at one point for that adolescent and, and the same intervention for the same adolescents might not be uh, as useful at another time. So I think having in some way, um, some information coming from the adolescents uh, themselves that can help shape what is the advice for them to help them go in, in a direction which could prevent uh, the development of, of depression or you know, the further kind of relapses as well. Uh, it's probably something that you know, with Christiana we are, uh, and Helen and all the idea team, we are very interested in, in pursuing. I don't know, Christian, if you, if you want to add anything about that, but I think it's, it's very important in particular, you know, at, at the stage in which also resources are maybe limited and this could also be a way uh, that could be quite cost effective to, to reach out to adolescents who have less um, um, opportunity to access the services in particular across the low and middle income countries. Yeah, I think that's that's the, the our one of our visions for for the future, and and we would just like to add that uh, the issue of co-developing uh, all of this with the adolescents is also central to our view. So uh, we know that uh, uh, technology is something that it's it, it's new for everybody, and uh, I think that with the pandemic, uh, all of us um, uh, develop a new way of interacting or a more intense way of interacting through technology. Uh, uh, that certainly opens um, uh, new possibilities, but of course we have to to be sure and think that if this is the best way to go, and 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 nothing uh, would be uh, um, uh, uh, 
we need to, to, to understand this from the perspectives of the, of the different stakeholders and especially uh, from the adolescents. So uh, 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 although we see uh, a huge potential in technology, uh, we don't see uh, this possible without uh, the co-participation and the active participation of adolescents in the developing of such tools. I think that's a really important point, Christian. And I, I guess another aspect to that, which is, is what the, you're kind of planning already and, and doing with some of the other work, is also making sure it's adolescents within the context in which you want to use the intervention. So I guess one of the questions from, from uh, the plenary earlier was around stigma and, and kind of the, the temptation often for, for people in some countries, particularly in Western um, countries to kind of impose interventions in other contexts and as you say it's not just the adolescents but adolescents in a particular space and these things might not translate well across I mean even within global south um, or other countries let alone across I don't know if you want to add anything on that yeah definitely yeah but I think I mean the, for the idea we we don't we didn't have a specific focus on on stigma, but this is something that we kind of really acknowledge. And I think in Brandon in particular is not here, but he's been doing quite a lot of work in that and definitely kind of development of educational kind of more psychoeducation approaches to uh, change uh, in a way some of the mentality around uh, you know, uh, mental health or uh, kind of uh, it, it's, it's very important not only for um, improving the access to care, but also to reduce the risk uh, that is also associated with the heavy weight of, of stigma um, uh, in, uh, in, in that sense. So it, it's definitely something that needs to be uh, tackled uh, as well. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think one of our kind of key concerns really with a lot of the risk calculator work is not is about how, how do you broach that with adolescents and their families? Um, if you want to provide that kind of information about future risks, um, we do it so commonly in, in physical health, and even then we have to think carefully about it. But I think for mental health, it's, uh, it's, it's been happening to a degree with things like psychosis for a while, but it tends to be people who are already distressed and, and starting to, to have emerging um, issues and therefore are seeking help. Whereas here, we're really going much further back and, and the adolescent doesn't have often um, any symptoms or, or distress, but we're saying actually there is a there is a risk, and I think that's a, a huge issue and an important one to think about. And as, as Brandon talked about in his presentation, one we're keen to to get different perspectives on, um, and, and that's an important thing to to consider before really thinking about implementing any of this type of, of work. I guess the other thing related to that 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 really came out strongly from that. That final presentation was also that a lot of the stakeholders um, were concerned about the, the stigmatization potentially of, of, of the risk information, but also about what on earth would happen after that. And, and we're very keen, I think, to, to point out that it's you can't just say someone's at risk and then not have anything to offer them. Um, and that you've got to have the resource and the interventions kind of developed to do that. And I guess in a way for us as a, as a consortium, that's partly why we pivoted slightly um, away from kind of going forwards with implementing the risk calculator and, and really started to think quite um, strongly about how what those interventions would look like and how we might implement them. Okay, I'm conscious we only got a couple of minutes left of our live q and I don't see, I don't know if anyone else can, but I can't see any particular questions in the chat. I don't know if anyone, Krishna Villary, wants to add anything um, before I bring the session to a close. Particularly. <laughs> no, not particularly. I just just wanted to to add and, and reinforce that this has been a a, a very exciting journey uh, that started uh, in 2017. Um, I think that the possibility of conducting uh, this kind of research with a multidisciplinary team from uh, multiple geographies across the world has been a, a unique opportunity for 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 me for the group here in Brazil. Uh, um, and uh, I really think that shifting our focus uh, to not only to symptoms or uh, to biology, but also to sociodemographic variables uh, and 
not uh, and, and bringing all this information together in a, in a single research project or uh, in a single research consortium has been uh, a tremendous uh, opportunity for understand better uh, mental health of uh, teenagers, adolescents. So uh, I'm really grateful to be to be part of this group. Well, thank you for, for being a huge part of it and a massive thanks to all of the people involved. It's a, it's a humongous team effort um, with people from, uh, from Brazil, from the UK, from the US, Nepal, and from Nigeria, um, and many colleagues in other places around the world as well now as we spread our, our wings a bit more. Um, and just fantastic and, and huge thanks particularly to, to MQ, Mental Health Charity, um, who are based in the UK, but an international charity, um, who really believed in us at the beginning and, and had a huge investment in this work. So huge thanks to, to them and everyone involved. And many thanks to everyone here for um, listening and for Christian Valeri and Brandon for their um, talks. Um, just to say that these recordings will be available um, on demand um, about 24 to 48 hours after we finish. Um, and uh, please do stay in this room or you might want to, to come back in a bit um, for the closing of the day. Thank you so much for your time.